Good evening, man. Good evening, everybody. Uh, like we were saying yesterday, ever since I was a little kid and I became interested in subjects like history, philosophy, the arts, all the useless ones, I began to realize how the way we actually approached those classes was in the shape of a long continuum of isms or trends that basically covered human development for centuries. Classicism, neoclassicism, humanism, vanguardism, modernism, you name it. And I was always struck by the fact that every single ism and trend was an automatic rejection of the previous one. Like, you know, these old guys did not know what they were doing, so you know what, we're going to start a new trend and drop, drop everything from, from before in the bin and start from scratch. But actually, starting from scratch was not so simple, because as soon as there was another new movement that kicked in, everything from the past was gone. So, most of these movements actually thought that they were reinventing the wheel with their best intentions. Like, you know, they were more connected to the current times, to the context, and that was the way to move forward. But actually, when you looked into them in details, uh, it was actually very stupid to do like that, because really, they were not saying much more new. They were actually kind of like reiterating basic evolution. It is pretty obvious that some of those had some interesting ideas, like, for example, humanism. Man, I'm done with this theocentric stuff. Let's put humans in the middle and forget about all of our problems. Good. Renaissance. How about we actually take a look at how Romans and Greeks did things and learn from them? Okay, I'm in. Bangardism. Man, I'm so tired of this bourgeois shit. It's so boring and conservative. You know, I want to find a new revolution that encompasses the arts, where we start from scratch once and we're happy ever after. Perfect. Now, I've learned, obviously, you probably noticed that too, that the actual ism, the, one, the, the label that historians gave, came after the actual event. You know, in a way, it's stupid to think that one day in the 1400s, some sort of humanist woke up in the morning and said, actually, you know what, I'm actually tired of putting God in the middle. You know, I'm tired of all that. Let's put an end to the dark ages. Somebody turn on the lights. I feel like a humanist now. That didn't happen like that. So the point is that regardless of the role that historians had in the actual classification, it was obvious that most of the people tried to adhere to a movement so that they felt part of something, which is something that humans actually suffer from. Suffer from. Part, I mean, trends and evolution are part of who we are as humans. And since in evolution the only constant is change, that brings me to the topic that I want to discuss with you all tonight, which are trends in education. As an educator myself, I actually like to share some of my, my insights because you probably heard out there that everybody in this world has their own theory about education. So I said, why not share mine? Uh, and obviously, I'm calling them my own, but this idea has possibly been published somewhere, repackaged, given some sort of pseudoscience from a, science, from a, a prestigious university somewhere and sold to a district in southwestern Missouri, for example. Uh, some of the trends you probably are familiar with. You might have heard of traditional learning, project-based learning. You have inquiry-based learning, experiential learning. And then you got the multiple intelligences theory, the backward design, the design thinking, holistic education, multiple learning styles, child-centered learning. And ob these obviously are followed by the Montessori style, the interdisciplinary, the educational, the behaviorism, connectivism, the cognitive constructivism, the social constructivism, the real world learning. And of course, when it's all said and done, we come back to the basics of education. So, just like the historical movements that I mentioned before, all those labels were put there in a way of like rejecting everything that had come from before. All the past was useless, you know, and we actually had to dismiss the old methods like, you know, nobody wanted to adhere to those anymore. 
My opinion, that was a mistake. And after many years of working in education, I've come to the conclusion that actually all those isms, trends, movements have something that we can actually use. They actually contain good ideas about how we all teach and obviously how kids learn. And why should we actually dismiss them is something I ponder to myself oftentimes. Maybe though, a theory of theories that it encompasses however many isms and trends are there and that combines them all, it's actually a good way to make most kids successful. And successful, I know here, means different things to different people, and that's fine. But let me talk to you a little bit more in detail of what I mean. What do all these trends have in common? Hopefully, they be they're based on research, some solid research, and the ideas provide from experiencing how kids and teachers, how kids learn and teachers uh, teach. Pretty basic. So instead of schools and teachers having to detach themselves from any previous ism or trend, maybe actually reinventing the well as the wheel as I was telling before, maybe what we could do is take advantage of all the knowledge that those trends provide us with. Having them all in one single school and at the same time. Now, that sounds a little bit chaotic and dysfunctional, I know. But actually, that's already happening. This diversity of teaching styles and of learning styles are already happening, and that's totally fine. Let's not forget, though, that I'm talking about practical teaching. And the difference between practical and theoretical teaching is that the first one is happening, it's based on what's actually happening, and the other one is based on, you know, a bunch of symmetrical planning with some sequential approach that's repackaged to sell seminars, curricular materials, etc., etc. I reckon, I think, there's nothing wrong with some kids learning the old style, the classic way, some of the kids definitely benefit from the project-based learning that can explore their individual talents. And some of the kids are super successful when they are uh, exposed to the Montessori style. Why not? Different experiences, different kids, different teachers, all put together. So the fact that historians, like I said before, try to classify and that pedagogists also try to make sense of how does education work doesn't mean that we have to actually choose one over the other. Let's encompass it all. To do that, to encompass it all, encompass it all I am not sure that we need to throw the old and stick to a new one. Like I said, appreciate diversity, a word that you have probably heard recently more often than ever, right? Different caring teachers, different styles of learning. Like I said, let's make, let's make sure that we can make it all together to be successful in schools. Administrators at times, with our best intentions, they try to kind of like plan top to bottom some sort of like coherent, consistent system in one school so that everybody feels included. It feels so included and so predictable in a way that sometimes you feel like even if you plugged in a robot, anybody could teach the lesson. It is very important uh, that they say that kids feel safe in school and that they are consistent and that they can go from one class to the other, and that's fine. But my question is, what happens when a kid that has been exposed to the same single system goes into the real world? Some of them, as we know, research seems to indicate, they suffer from overprotection. There is a clash between the school environment, all safe, and reality. Now, I am not talking about making the school hell so that it mimics reality. Not talking about that. But it is true that some kids could even benefit from being exposed to some methodologies that might feel, at the beginning, discomforting. So let me end, that, let me end this speech by suggesting that schools that are already filled with a diversity, a diverse array of, of teaching styles, can actually use those, use these resources as a personal uh, anecdote, I could tell you that you probably noticed, and not very noticed, I'm not very good at following a script. 
I like to improvise a lot. Because, you know, what happens when you go into the classroom, all that planning that you have in front of you, and suddenly the kids show up from a math test, they feel brain dead, thank you math teachers, they have no intentions of working with you, what do you do? You won't be able to move forward. So you might as well allow the kids to vent and maybe discuss some, some aspect of what goes on out there in reality and have a lesson on, you know, things that actually affect them more than just following your actual plans. Education, you probably noticed, is a, is a tethered profession, okay? That means that even if you had the best possible system implemented and bought into by teachers, you still will not be able to control what goes on into the classroom because the teacher would have the last say. All this homogenization in schools, the constant testing, the fact that our direct contact with kids is not appreciated sometimes by the administrators is what's actually making finding motivated quality teachers out there. Teaching may be another profession than the one you have in mind, but it's an essential fabric to what actually creates or makes a good society. Let us not forget that is you, if you probably notice all these totalitarian governments and those that are democratically elected but act in totalitarian terms do want to get their hands of what goes on in the classroom. Let's think about that. I would say do not force teachers into buying into the latest trend or ism. Let them choose professionally with their passions and with their knowledge and expertise all from all the best aspects of different theories and reach kids in a much more productive way. Thank you so very much, and God bless the American School of Barcelona.